Would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you um, have done what we could not. You have saved us from our sin. You have rescued us from the darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light. Lord, today we desire to hear from your word. Lord, nobody came here to hear me. They came here to hear you. I pray you give us ears to hear and faith to believe your word. And then we might apply it to our lives in a way that not only impacts us, but overflows onto our families and onto our coworkers and our neighbors and the city of Janesville and throughout the world. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. And we thank you for the goodness that it brings us, the blessing that it brings us to worship a God who is actually worthy and that we don't settle for idols and lesser things. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather together here in your name. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. I do have to make one quick uh, reminder announcement. One of the things I left out during the announcements is for the potluck, there is a sign up, a blue sheet in the back. So be sure if you're um, if you'd like to bring something to that potluck, please sign up on that sheet in the back um, so that we can have that for the potluck on the 28th um, in the business meeting. So. Yeah, check that out. There's a blue sheet back there. Sign up for it um, and bring something that you'd like to share with the rest of the congregation um, for the food. Now, at this time, I'd like you to please turn in your Bibles to Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. That's Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. If you are unfamiliar with Matthew, it is in the New Testament. Um, the New Testament begins uh, about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. So it's a little bit past the midpoint. And you'll go to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 3. If you need a Bible, we have uh, several Bibles underneath the um, tables back there by the offering box, as well as the bookshelf in the back. If you don't own a Bible, feel free to take one that you, uh, you like, and it's our gift to you. We can't think of anything better to give you than a copy of God's Word. So today we're in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Last week we looked at chapter 2, verses 13 through 23, and we saw the difficult reality of Jesus' road um, to save us. Even from the very beginning of his life, Jesus is running from Herod for his life. He's escaping to Egypt, danger, um, turmoil, right, sorrow, the loss of many children in Bethlehem because of Herod's wickedness. Jesus' road, the Savior's road, was a difficult one. And the road that we walk in this life is similar. We're going to follow the path that Jesus took, and it's full of hills and valleys and roots and difficult things, trials of life, sorrows, tragedies, temptation, Satan's, um, uh, his schemes, the world's temptations. And we looked at John chapter 16, verse 33, to really sum up what last week's sermon was about um, and, and learn from it and how it comforts us. It says this, in this world, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And we know that in Christ, as we looked at the Savior's road, though it's challenging, though there's trials and tribulations in Christ, we too will overcome this world. And so that's what we saw last week. We are overcomers in Christ, and we were encouraged by his sovereignty and his care and his providence in Jesus' life through all the tumults and turmoil that he faced. And we know that the same Father is with us. He's walking with us. He's watching over us. Jesus is with us through his Holy Spirit, walking through these things so that we are not alone. This week in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, Matthew has fast-forwarded in Jesus' life quite a bit. Jesus is now an adult, and we're not actually going to see uh, or interact with Jesus directly yet. We're actually going to interact with his forerunner, his cousin, John the Baptist. That's who we're looking at in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Matthew has introduced, he's introducing John the Baptist, this prophet who came ahead of Jesus in his public ministry to announce his coming and prepare the people's hearts for Jesus to come. So, and as again, I say his name was John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist, um, through his life and through what he preaches, we're actually going to behold some pretty awesome and weighty truths about the gospel and about who Jesus is. And we're to come to understand um, his his preaching, what he preached, repent, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, live in repentance. 
So Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, these are the words of God through Matthew. It says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region of the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Verse 8, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees, Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he, he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. I've entitled today's sermon, True Repentance. True Repentance. What is repentance? And the main takeaway here is understanding what the meaning of biblical repentance is and its significance not only in salvation, but in our everyday Christian life as we follow Christ unto glory. And so that's really what I want you to see today. And I'm actually going to begin by giving you the answer to those questions um, in a summary. So before we jump in, what is repentance? What does biblical repentance mean, to repent? The word metanoia in the Greek is what the word repent is, metanoia. And what it means is to have a change of mind, to have a change of faith, if you really want to get down to it, and even deeper, a change of God's, a, a change of your mindset about who is Lord of your life. To repent is to change your mind about where you're going and who you're following, um, in, in salvation, when we repent, we say, okay, I'm not a good Lord of my life. I'm not even a good person apart from Christ. Even my good works are stained with pride. Jesus is better. You see that 180 right there, that change of mind. I'm, I'm going to have a new mindset about where I'm going, what I believe, because what you believe impacts directly what you do. A.W. Tozer, uh, a. A. Tozer actually said this. He said, what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. Our view vertically, what Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Anderson puts it this way, he says, what we believe vertically directly impacts what we do horizontally. So repentance is not a change of behavior. It results in a change of behavior. We need to understand that difference. This is a root to fruit thing. The root is, is that my belief changes. My faith changes. I'm no longer trusting in myself or the world or some idol I'm trusting in Jesus, and because I'm trusting in Jesus, by the power of his, his word and his supernatural power living in me by his spirit, he actually changes me, the behavior, the fruit changes. My roots change about what I believe, and now the fruit of my life, the actions, the thoughts, the words change as well. That's the power of the gospel when I believe it. Okay, so that's repentance. Repentance is this change of mind, this change of the root that leads to a change of the fruit, the behavior of your life, the conduct of your life. Repent, repentance does not mean that you clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. That's not what it means. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Repentance means I can't clean myself up. I need to come to Jesus to get cleaned up. Do you understand? I need him to sanctify my life. I need him to save me from my sin. I need him to transform me. That's repentance. Okay, so when we understand repentance, I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this text because I want you to know what it really means. It's a change of mind that leads to a transformation outwardly. It's an inward transformation that only God can do through our faith in the gospel in Christ. Okay, So verses 1 through 4, let's begin there with the exposition. I'll read it again to you. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So here, Matthew introduces us to John the Baptist. And the question that we have to ask is, who was John the Baptist? Well, for starters, he was a baptizer. Amen? He was a Baptist. And we see here that he liked to eat too. I'm hoping that we don't have locusts at our potluck in a couple weeks, though. Um, John the Baptist was living out in the wilderness. He's living a humble life for the glory of the Lord. And he was baptizing people. Uh, a little bit about his backstory. He was actually Jesus' cousin. So he was born to Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, and he was conceived uh, shortly before Jesus was. And he was conceived in, uh, in Elizabeth by her husband, Zechariah. And th this was a miraculous um, conception because Elizabeth was bar barren. It was not the same as Jesus' miraculous conception because Mary was a virgin, and that was done by the power of the Holy Spirit, a much greater miracle. But nevertheless, John the Baptist's um, conception in his birth was a miracle too because Elizabeth up to that point was barren. And so God had a plan. He worked in Elizabeth's life, and he uh, brought about through Zechariah and her a child named John, and he became known as John the Baptist. So he's Jesus' slightly older cousin. And we know that he had a very special calling in his life from the very beginning because in Luke chapter 1, verses 41, verse 41, it says that when Elizabeth heard that uh, the greeting of Mary, her cousin, comes in, Mary's also pregnant, um, the baby, John, leapt in her womb, or he leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit in that moment. A few verses earlier in Luke 1, 15, it actually tells us that John the Baptist himself was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. That's an amazing thing. John had a very important calling on his life. Now, John is considered by many to be, well, he is, in fact, the last, but he's also considered by many to be the greatest prophet of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament. You say, wait, we're in the New Testament. Yes, but John was living under the Old Covenant. He is the final prophet before the Christ. He is the one who gets to introduce the Christ. And therefore, he has the greatest, highest honor of all of them. John was a prophet. Jesus actually said about John that he was the greatest man who ever lived up to that point. Of course, he was uh, not talking about himself as well. Jesus obviously was greater than John the Baptist, but Jesus was truly God and truly man. But John the Baptist, of, of, of all the people who had been born, all the men who had been born, he was the greatest man who ever lived, Jesus said. In fact, I'll read it to you. It's in Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 11. Jesus gives a eulogy of John after Herod beheaded him. And Jesus says this, As they went away, Jesus, or the word says this, As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So Jesus confirms no one's ever been born that's greater than John the Baptist. He's a great man. He's full of humility. He really trusts God. Even greater than David. Even greater than Elijah, whom he's compared to. He's the greatest man, except for the one who's least in the kingdom of heaven. And I believe with all my heart, I'm very confident that Jesus was actually indirectly speaking of himself because no one was more least in the kingdom of heaven than the one who was truly God. He came to earth to live this life face the trials we face, then die on the cross for the sin of mankind. Jesus became the least in the kingdom of heaven, and therefore God exalted him above every name. Amen? So Jesus is talking about John the Baptist being the greatest. Of course, he confirms that, that he himself is greater in the Father's eyes. Nevertheless, John was very humble. He trusted in God. He walked with God. He was a great man. 
And finally, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, what I, which I just alluded to. Luke 1.17 says this, And he will go before him, he, John, will go before him, Christ, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So he's comparing to the prophet Elijah, who is, uh, was in the past, and, and turn to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now, some in his time thought that maybe John the Baptist was actually Elijah because Elijah um, rode into heaven on a chariot. He didn't, pr presumably, he didn't die. And so they thought, well, he's come back from heaven now to prepare the way for the Christ. He's actually Elijah. Others thought that John the Baptist was the Christ. The way he preached with authority, the way he was um, prophesying, they thought maybe he is the Christ. But John himself denied both of these. And you'll find that in the Apostle John's Gospel. Um, John chapter 1, verses 19 through 23 tells you that. And there, it, simply John responds to these things that are said to him. He says, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So he says, I'm not Elijah, and I'm not Christ. He denies it. I'm the one that Isaiah spoke of who was coming before Christ. I'm a different prophet. Here's Isaiah's prophecy a little bit more fully. Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low, the uneven ground made level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So John is this prophet that God prophesied of long before, and he he ordained him to be raised up as a forerunner to Christ. John's calling, church family, was to till the soil of people's hearts and prepare them to receive Christ, to believe in Christ. That was the goal. That was the point. John's job was to till the soil, to work people's hearts and prepare a way for the Lord to be believed in. And then after John, Jesus uh, took his ministry, we know that John, um, he backed away. He stepped away. Jesus is ministry started, and John the Baptist stepped back. He said this in John 3.30, He, Jesus, must increase, I must decrease. And John is actually, it's interesting, we don't think about John very often. He, he, he literally is, we, when we think, oh man, all these great people in the Bible, we almost never think of John the Baptist. Like, he just humbly set himself behind Jesus and let himself be almost forgotten. Even though he's in the Word, like, we just don't think about him. And yet Jesus said he was the greatest man who ever lived besides himself. It's amazing. That's humility. That's an amazing humility. Now, let's try to understand the magnitude of the news that these people are hearing from John as he's preaching to them. And John is crying out. He's preaching in the wilderness, uh, make, way a ready for the, make a way ready for the Lord. Um, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's crying out to them. It says in verse 5 that Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. This is amazing. These people are all going out to John to be baptized. And you can't help but think to yourself, I mean, there might have been hundreds, there may have been thousands. I would love to have John the Baptist's biceps after, after baptizing that many people, right? I mean, that's crazy. Like he was doing so much. But in all seriousness, John's impact was profound. It says all the region of the Jordan area. I mean, this is a lot of people. Jerusalem, people are coming out in droves to be baptized. God is doing a supernatural work through John the Baptist preaching. John is telling them, hey, the time has finally come. The anointed one, the holy one of Israel, the Messiah who was promised. He is at the doorstep. He's been living among you and you had no idea. He is here. He is here. Generation after generation had heard the prophecies of old and the prophets of their lifetime had given new prophecies of the Christ to come. But now, John is saying, the wait is over. Be baptized. Cleanse yourself outwardly. Prepare your hearts internally. Be ready because he's about to be revealed. This is profound. Here he is. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is not far off anymore. This isn't just a distant hope. Maybe he'll show up in our lifetime. He is in your lifetime. He has come. John is being clear. He is preaching the gospel. It's within our reach. 
all that it is to taste and know and belong to the kingdom of heaven is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Church family, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Jesus said, I am the door by which you enter into the sheepfold. I'm the door. I'm how you get into the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, truly. And Jesus is about to be revealed. Now again, I'm going to read verse 5, and then I want to go through verse 9, and we'll unpack that. Then, in, then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region of the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for, as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. So herein we have the heart of our passage today. And what I believe is the key verse to this passage, verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. This is John's message. Repent, bear fruit, the Christ has come. Prepare your hearts, be ready to have a change of mind. I know you've been corrupted by many things from the Pharisees and the scribes, all this stuff. I want you to change your mind about what you believe and what you trust in your own flesh. I want you to think about this. Christ is coming to save you. You need to trust in him. Have a change of mind. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. And if you are living in sin, repent of that. Turn away. Say, I hate my sin. I need Jesus. I need him. That doesn't mean necessarily they can clean themselves up, but no, I need someone to clean me up. I need Jesus to come save me. This is what John is preaching to them. Matthew also introduces us to another group of people um, going out to see John's preaching. It's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But it's clear from John's response to them um, that most of them have not come out, most of these people have come out, not come out to actually hear his preaching and repent. The Pharisees and Sadducees, namely, have come out for a different reason. And John knows that. So we have two different crowds that have come out, one that's really large and one that's fairly small. And so let's unpack their differences so that we can really understand the significance of um, true repentance um, versus non-repentance or false repentance. That way it becomes clear to us. So the first crowd we see in verses 5 and 6, the larger crowd, the people, the multitudes who are coming, um, they are Jews from Jerusalem and Judea and all the uh, Jordan River region, and they're coming out to hear John and respond to his preaching. They're responding with true repentance and faith, uh, which are like two sides of the same coin. It's a tautology. Again, you don't... Repentance is not a work, it's part of faith. You have to stop believing in one thing to have faith in another that is basically opposed to that thing. You can't believe in yourself as Lord of your life and believe in Jesus as Lord of your life. You have to repent of one of those. You have to turn away from believing in yourself. So repentance is necessary for faith. It's not a work. It is part of faith. It's a change of mind. And so that's what's happening here in this group. They're coming out. And the evidence of this is clear because they're, you can see the fruit of their lives. They're coming out and being baptized. They're responding. If you really believe something, you act on it. Amen? If you really believe something, it changes the way you live. So they come out and be baptized. And confession is part of that, re- that repentance. Hey, we're sinners. We need a Savior. There's a Savior who's come, John says. Uh, he's coming soon. He's already here. He's about to reveal himself. Let's make ourselves clean outwardly. Let's associate with this. Let's um, be unashamed to say we're, we are ready to believe in the Christ. That's what they're doing. And so their actions, the fruit of their lives, is showing that they really believe. Their confession is coupled with an immersive bath, so to speak, which would have been familiar to them in, in their Jewish practices. Um, it's called a mikvah. It's a pool where people would come in for different religious reasons. The Jews would come and clean themselves for a ceremony or something. For instance, today, they still do it. The Jewish people still do it before a wedding a lot of times. They'll take a bath as a symbolic cleansing, like, okay, I'm leaving behind my old life and I'm coming into this new marriage. It's something that they practice. They were familiar with this, except for now they're out in the wilderness and they're being dunked by someone else, which is a sign that this is a work of God that's about to happen to you. Someone else is going to do this to you, this this dying to your old self and making uh, entering into new life in Christ, 
This is a work of God, not something you do to yourself. You can't clean yourself. So it's symbolic of all those things. Christ's death and resurrection to come, obviously many of them had no idea that's what it was pointing to, um, but they were coming out and responding to John's preaching. What Jesus is about to do to them spiritually through the Spirit, that's what this is a sign of. And so the people are bearing fruit, true repentance, change of mind, a shift of belief, and much of their faith and understanding previously had been, as I said, messed up by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these people who claimed to know God, but they were twisting the law and they were twisting God's word and they didn't really know God. So they had a lot, not only their own sin to repent of, but they also had to have a change of mind about how they even saw God because there was a lot that was messed up. There was a lot of things that were um, corrupted. And so John's preaching the truth to them. And so they're posturing themselves and making straight a path to their heart. Let's clear out everything. Lower, if you have something blocking Jesus from coming in, church family, you got to remove it. You, you're, you're, there's something in the way of your relationship with him. That's, that's the picture here. Yes, Jesus literally um, is moving all things out of the way to reveal himself to the people on earth. He's, he's making it so it's very clear. I am the Savior. And so that's that figurative language of lowering the mountains and raising the valleys, making this flat so everyone can see, all flesh can see. And that continues on to the final day when he's revealed and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. But in their hearts, figuratively speaking, there's all these things that are crowding out the way. And, and John's saying, clear your hearts out. Uh, you know, steps, make way for yourself to believe in Christ. Repent of the things you used to think. There's a new way. There's a gospel, a good news that Jesus has come to save you. So I know I'm belaboring this, but I want you to really understand repentance is this change of mindset and beliefs at the core of who you are and how you view God and yourself and sin in the world. And it results in this outward expression, this living out that shows that you are actually experiencing a transformation on the inside. I want to belabor this because you need to understand that this is a root to fruit thing. You don't earn your way to salvation. You don't earn your way to heaven. You know that. But I want you to understand why. I want you to see that that's clear in Scripture. You start with faith in Christ. The gospel comes to you. He empowers you by his grace to believe and trust. He makes you alive in himself. And you've believed and you've trusted in Jesus. And that change of that root is like a tree. If you were to plant a new seed and you said, oh, this is an apple tree, you plant that seed, what do you expect to come up out of that? Apples. You expect the tree to bear apples. If you plant an orange tree and you plant the seed or you um, put even a, a tree in the ground and you plant it, you expect that one day you'll get oranges. If you've truly trusted in Christ, if that seed's real, you really have a genuine faith and you really repented and trusted in him, that root, that seed that he put, he is growing it in you. He's transforming your life, and there should be real fruit that looks like Jesus. If there's not real fruit in our lives that looks like Jesus and is increasing, you're not perfect, but it's growing. You're seeing yourself become more like Christ, not even on your, just on your own. You're, you're part of it. You're making you know, every, every effort to become more like Christ, but it's not even you, you know it's not really you doing it. You know Christ is changing you. It's, it's crazy. You're like, man, I, I just know God is changing my heart. He's convicting me. He's changing the way I see the world and how I live. And you know that it's not just you and your flesh trying to live up to something. God is changing you. You know it. Man, I'm different. And you see yourself increasing. And yes, you might have back sets at times. You might backslide a little bit. But then you see God come through and you miss him. You're like, man, I, I just am far from you, Lord. I want to be back with you again. And you see him move your life forward again to look more like Jesus, to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness. He's, he's giving you himself. He lives in you. He's planted this seed in you and you've, you've bared roots. You're saved if you've trusted in Christ, truly. And then now what he's doing, he's going into every single area of your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Every area of your life, every branch, and he's making it alive. Your personal walk with Jesus, your relationships with others, you, your, your work, the way you think about money, the way you think about possessions, the way you think about your time, the Holy Spirit's going in there and he's replacing the lie of the serpent that you should trust yourself with the truth of Jesus that Jesus is better. Trust him, behold him, follow him. 
in this area of your life. And he works on the next one. He's working on, he's, he's really working on all of them. He's making you into what he said you are. You are now righteous in Christ positionally. I'm going to practically work this out in your life. I'm going to make you look like him. We'll never reach perfection in this life. We will reach perfection when he glorifies us in the day of adoption. We have the spirit of adoption. We will be adopted officially fully. You already are children of God, but there will be like this celebration in heaven, right? And you're made like Jesus completely and thoroughly, physically and spiritually, okay? But in this life, God is transforming you. And that happens through daily, regularly keeping with repentance. It's, it's keeping with it. Every day you wake up and say, Jesus is better. Jesus did it better. Jesus, only you can do it better through me. Every day. Jesus, you take his own words from John 15, 5. Jesus, I'm a branch. You're the vine. Apart from you, I can do nothing. I can do nothing. You wake up every day. That's repentance. That's abiding in Christ. So your repentance for salvation changed your root. And your repentance in salvation, that sanctification, transforms your branches to bear good fruit to look like Jesus. He is the Spirit of God, is, is ruthlessly hunting down every lie of the serpent that you have ever believed, and he's replacing it with the truth of Christ. Amen? He is hunting it down in your life, and he's saying, look, see the way you're living, see the way you're responding in this situation, see how you're, you're, you're doing this, see what you just said today? Is that like Christ? No. Let me empower you. Let me give you some power. You're convicted now. Let me show you how to live by his word. Let me show you how to look like him more. That's why I give you that language of behold, believe, and become. You behold the glory of Jesus so that you can believe more deeply in him and less in yourself or something else. And then you can become more like him. That's the process of sanctification. It is all of life to the fullness of Christ. It is an overflow. And this language transforms us. The work of God in our lives is overflow. Fruit is the overflow of a tree's root. Amen? That's what it is. This is how salvation works. It can't work the other way. You can't start with just behavior and somehow fake it till you make it. It doesn't work. The Pharisees try to fake it till they make it. They don't know God. It doesn't work. You, you have to actually be in a relationship with Jesus, walking with him, beholding him, believing in him. All things that have to do with faith and not your own works. Recognizing in that faith that you can't do it yourself. Now let's look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees' lack of repentance to better understand true repentance. Understanding what repentance isn't or what it doesn't look like can help us understand what it really is as well. So first, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Who were they? Well, they were different in some ways. Like for instance, the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, no final resurrection of the dead. They just believed you died, there was no afterlife. Okay? But they held many similar beliefs that the Pharisees did, and they liked to travel together, even though they disagreed on this. And so they were Jewish businessmen and societal leaders who prided themselves in being um, students of God's word and religious tradition. Okay? They corruptly pushed forward the idea that the oral tradition of their fathers held equal authority to God's word. And that's where the poison came in. They began to create rules that were not in the Bible. And then they twisted things to manipulate people. And then the love of money and the love of themselves and the praise of themselves just continued to grow and grow until they were utterly corrupt. Now, not all of the Pharisees were corrupt. The Sadducees kind of had to be because they didn't believe even in the resurrection. So they're way off. But um, not all of them were totally corrupt, but they were very far from God. Even Nicodemus, who I believe ended up coming to know the Lord later on, um, he, he just didn't understand the things of God. He didn't really have a relationship with him. Even though they were the ones who acted like they were closer to God than anybody. Look at us. We pray, we fast. But that was the issue. Look at us and not him. Right? A real relationship with God says, I must decrease, he must increase. Amen? Same attitude as John. I, I want people to see Jesus in me. I don't, they can forget about me. I want them to know him. That was not the Pharisees and the Sadducees' attitude. Their confidence was not in God. Their hope was not in God. It was um, They were self-righteous. They were entitled and full of pride. They loved power and notoriety and money and the praises of people and each other. And John knew exactly who they were when they approached. He had dealt with them before, no doubt. 
He says, you brood of vipers, that's what he calls them. Their teaching was a deadly venom to people's souls. They purported the same lie that the serpent has always purported to us, tried to tell us. Hey, trust in yourself. Trust in your own strength. Trust in your own flesh, not in God. That's the lie of the serpent. The same thing, the way they live, the same thing they, they preach. Trust in yourself. Now, they would say, oh, trust in God, but then they, the way they, they interact with people, you need to do this, you need to do that. They're very much just religious without a relationship with God. They were a brood of vipers. Faith in self is the opposite of biblical repentance. Biblical repentance does not go to the corner of guilt and think, you know, if I just feel really guilty or if I just work really hard, I'll work my way back to God. That's utterly ridiculous. It's ridiculous. God is opening his arms and saying, true repentance is to come to me and say, God, I have fallen short. I need you. I need you. I know I don't deserve you, but I trust that you'll take me back. David, I mean, David cried out, Lord, please don't remove your spirit from me. But he trusted God wouldn't. That's why he came to him. He didn't go hide from God. He came to God and said, God, I need you. The heart of repentance. The heart of repentance. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, John says. John's sarcasm here is right on point. As though these men have come out to actually prepare their hearts to receive Christ. But nevertheless, John still gives them the gospel. He says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. John helps them see the error of their ways, even though he knows why they're there. That they're not, they're just there to, to gather maybe evidence to accuse him or uh, hackle him or try to turn people's hearts away, right? Um, John still gives them the gospel. I want to read verse 9 again. He says this, he says, And do not presume that to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to... From these stones to raise up children of Abraham. That's an amazing statement. Again, the Pharisees and Sadducees had put confidence, the confidence for their salvation, it was misplaced. They put it in something besides God Himself. They put it in themselves and their works and their earthly identity, their pedigree. Oh, we're Jews. Now, everybody that was going out to John were truly Jewish people for the most part. But they had taken pride, the Pharisees and Sadducees had taken pride in this aspect. Oh, we're children of Abraham. They figured that by default, since they were part of the chosen people, they had salvation. And where their hearts were really with God didn't matter. They just had a free pass, right? That's what they're thinking. They were pure blood Jews of the line of Abraham. They inherit salvation automatically. That's not true. John refutes this thinking, and so did Paul the Apostle later on. Listen to him in chapter 9 of Romans, verse 6. He says, not all who are of Israel, are truly Israel. Back up a little bit in Romans 2, chapter 2, verses 28 through 29, and Paul says this, No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. And then he says in verse 29, But a Jew is one inwardly. So all the things that the Pharisees were doing, they looked Jewish. I mean, they looked like Israelites. They looked like God's chosen people. They looked like they were following the law, blameless on the outward as Paul, what Paul was, he said, I was blameless on the outside. I did everything exactly according to the law. I followed all the traditions inside, far from God. Persecuted the church, in fact. He didn't even recognize God's real people. He didn't believe in Jesus at the time. He was Saul. And so he had this wrong mindset. John basically tells um, these guys, you are so far off from God that God could make better and more faithful sons of Abraham from the stones sitting there. Because you don't, know, you don't even know God. You just look like you do, and you've corrupted the people for your own selfish gain. I have no doubt that they were not pleased with John when he said this. <laughs> But the, the point is, is that we need to stop putting confidence in ourselves, in earthly things. We need to believe in Jesus, church family, every day. And I'm going to keep preaching this, believe in Jesus, because you know what? We're really good at forgetting. We're really, really good at saying, oh, I'm in a tough spot. I'm going to trust myself. We're really good at saying, oh, man, I just got to clean my life up so that God will love me again, come back. You say, oh, I don't believe that. But what do your actions say? What's the fruit say you're believing right now? Because even believers who are saved can have areas of unbelief in your life. You can have areas where you're not 
practically actually believing because the evidence of your life says, no, I'm trusting myself in this area. And so we got we to gotta challenge ourselves. Like, look at the way Paul saw this. He's like, I have Christ and nothing else. Philippians 3, verses 1 through 9, he says this. He, he, he says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in, in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also, if anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. He means back when I thought the church was the enemy, I was so willing to follow God. I thought I was following God. I was willing to kill people who weren't, who were trying to sabotage the, my, what I, he thought was the true faith. He was so wrong. As to, the, as to righteousness under the law, meaning his outward expression of it, blameless. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. There was no one more um, blameless than him on the outward. Then he says this, but whatever gain I had from those things, whatever gain I had, I count as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered a loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, or me trying to keep the law in my own strength, right? But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. This is not Paul saying, I've counted everything as a loss for the sake of Christ, talking about like, you know, earthly things and all that kind of stuff, like um, possessions and that. He means that. But what he really means is, I count everything that I thought I could put my hope in, all my confidence in myself all the achievements I've made that I thought gave me worth in my identity and would present me before God as, wow, you're amazing, Paul, right? He's like, it's all trash. It's all rubbish. It's garbage. I only have one thing. <laughs> I love Jesus because he first loved me. That's all I got. I got Jesus. That is my only, my only boast, and it's a horribly humiliating and beautiful boast because he had to die on a cross for my sin. It's not very fun to boast in. <laughs> I was so bad, Jesus had to die for me. That, that's, that's his only boast. That's, that's, that's what he glories in, is the glory of Christ, and not himself. And we should glory in that. We should seek glory, the glory of God, the glory that comes from God only, through Christ, and not any other kind of glory. He realized that he had fallen short. That's true repentance. Salvation is putting all your faith and hope in Jesus, especially, uh, excuse me, Salvation is putting all your faith and hope in Jesus and especially nothing else and no one else. And then the Christian life is continuing every single day to put all your faith and hope in Jesus and especially nothing else and no one else. Amen? Including yourself. Don't put your faith in yourself. That is the biggest one. The great sin is self-righteousness. It's what keeps people out of heaven. You think you can save yourself. That's what keeps you out of heaven. That's what keeps you away from the Father. Because if you won't accept his gift, how can you receive it? <laughs> Amen? I mean, like, how can you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior if you want to be the Lord and Savior of your life? It's impossible. It is impossible. You have to, you have to turn away from trusting yourself and trusting him. And this continues throughout your Christian life, not to earn your way, but rather as a way that you are growing closer to Jesus and, and he is proving through your life that you really belong to him. Behold the glory of Jesus. Believe more deeply in Jesus. And become more like Jesus. Why is this so vitally important? John the Baptist tells us why it's so important in verses 10 through 12. And we'll close with these, these verses. Even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is heavy. But he's talking to guys who are opposed to him and opposed to Christ. These guys are destroying the souls of people. They're venom. They're, they're like vipers. They're harming. He's speaking to them. But he's speaking to us too. Like, be warned. Fearing the Lord is a good thing. To, to remove the fear of the Lord and say, well, we just, 
God loves us, we just want to love him and that salvation and, and remove that fear. Like, oh, okay, you know, he's holy and we really don't deserve to be with him and he could destroy us. That's a healthy aspect of your salvation. We shouldn't walk in, in total fear all the time. Like, we're not coming into this like, oh, I'm, I never have a relationship with God because I'm so afraid to even talk to him. That's not what we're saying. But fearing the Lord is important. I love the Lord and I fear the Lord. And these two things are not in opposition to each other. They work together. The Lord loves me. He is, he is able to do, he doesn't owe me anything. He's able to destroy me. And yet he was merciful and he loves me. That's amazing. And I'm going to live in his love. But I still fear the Lord. <laughs> Amen? I fear the Lord. I realize that he is in control. He is sovereign over all things. And I am not. Jesus knows who trusts in him as Lord and Savior and who doesn't. Every person that has the Holy Spirit belongs to him. And whoever doesn't, doesn't. That's it. The Holy Spirit is your seal. If you've trusted in Christ, you've believed that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he'll give you his Holy Spirit. You have his Holy Spirit if you trusted in Jesus. If you don't have his Holy Spirit and there's not fruit of the Spirit coming out in your life increasingly, um, and maybe some setbacks, but increasingly throughout life, you, you need to really examine your heart. Am I just going through the motions, or do I actually know God? Do I really know him? On judgment day, it will be very clear to Jesus who has really believed in him unto eternal life and who has not believed in him unto eternal damnation. That's what John's saying here. That's what he's presenting to us. Look, there's a real judgment coming. You need to be ready. You need to believe in Christ. Turn away from yourself. It's a free gift. And he clarifies two things for us here that water bap in verse 11, water baptism does not save us, but it's an outward picture of the true baptism that saves us, baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then the second thing that he says here that, um, that clar he clarifies is these warnings that he's giving us are not on his own authority. There's one who's mightier than he who is coming. This is where it's coming from. This is Jesus' command to you. Repent and believe. Jesus said that. Repent and believe in the gospel. He is the one that judges. It will be the wrath of the Lamb on the last day. Or it will be the joy of the Lord on the last day, depending on where you are with Christ. So John's presenting these things in his message. Jesus is com coming, and this is wonderful news for those who receive him. But those who reject this good news, for those who cast aside God's grace and mercy and his free gift of eternal life, as John's pointing out here, eternal life in Christ, there will be hell to pay, literally. Unquenchable fire, he says. And he gives this illustration, and we'll close with this, and I just want to encourage you um, as you're walking, as you're here, to trust in Christ. Maybe you've trusted him for many years. Continue to reaffirm that each day. I, not that you have to get resaved, but you just continue to say, okay, Lord, I know thee. You know me. Okay, yeah, we're walking. I thank you for forgiving me. Walk with him. But if you've never trusted in him before, you need to hear these words from John. Repent. Have a change of mind. You're going the wrong way. Stop trusting yourself and trust in Christ. And the illustration he gives here is the threshing floor. So back in that day, they would take the wheat and they'd put it on this, this hard floor and they would either take sticks and, and pound it or they would stomp on it. And what would happen is, is the wheat weighed more than the chaff. So it would just it would fall out onto the floor. And then he would take his winnowing fork and he would take the chaff and he'd either it would some of it would blow away in the wind, but he'd make a pile for it to be burned. And then all the wheat would be left laying on the floor. You could gather it up and put it in the barn and use it. When we think about trusting in Christ, what God has done is he's given, given us this amazing anchor. He's given us this amazing weight of glory in our hearts so that we are not tossed by the wind. We're not like the chaff. We are weighed down. We're left on his threshing floor, and he gathers us up one day, and he brings us into his kingdom, and into the barn, right? Into the place where he um, is, is storing up uh, great joy and great um, goodness and blessing for us for eternity. Is the weight of glory in your heart, the glory of Jesus? Do you love him because he first loved you? That's the question. It's simple. That's what John is preaching. Let's pray. And what I ask the worship team, I'd like to ask the worship team to come on up as we finish. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. That, Lord, we can cling to you and we need nothing else. You really are all that we need. We thank you for 
um, the many blessings you give us in this life. But Lord, you are our hope for eternity. We put no confidence in the flesh. Help us, Jesus. Help us. This is so hard to remember. Lord, I know that I I pounded this home today, but I I pray that we would remember every day that it's so easy to drift away and trust ourselves in different circumstances. I pray that we wouldn't. That we would bear fruit in keeping with repentance all the days of our life as we follow you. Help us, Jesus, by your grace. I pray these things in your name. Amen.